My favorite TV show has always been House. I've laughed, I've cried, and I'm not exaggerating when I say I've seen it at least 20 times. At least. In a golden age of television, I think there are objectively better shows out there, but House is such a personal part of me. Maybe it's because I discovered it when I was a teenager, and when you love something when you're young, it sticks with you. Maybe it's because the show is that good. Are you comparing me to God? Revisiting the series reminds me of going home. Every moment is so familiar. I can touch the rhythm and the geography and the cadences. But going home is bittersweet because everything starts to feel like a size too small. Now you're a grown man, I thought you might like to look back to see how far you come. House premiered in 2004 and ended in 2012. Developed and executive produced by David Shore, Paul Antanasio, Katie Jacobs, and a fourth mystery guest who I'll reveal later on. Each episode is a medical puzzle spearheaded by Dr. Gregory House, a character defined by his rationality, so much so that he's an homage to Sherlock Holmes, literature's greatest detective. I've always been a huge Sherlock Holmes fan, and there's something just really wonderful about that character. Even the creators of Sherlock acknowledge House as a reassuring precedent for their modern anti-hero archetype. You know, happily, I think we were able to go, House, not because we were playing mm. bingo, mm. <laughs> but because <laughs> we, we could cite the wonderful precedent of, of a, a show clearly based on Sherlock Holmes mm. with a very, very grumpy protagonist whom everybody adores. I'm wearing a rumpled shirt and forgot to brush my hair this week. You've got athlete's foot in your nose. I'm ready to be judged. And to bring it full circle, Sherlock Holmes was based on Dr. Joseph Bell, a surgeon known for using meticulous observations to diagnose patients. Wow, Manual of the Operations of Surgery by Joseph Bell. So you can find references to Sherlock Holmes throughout the series. Think this might give us a clue, Sherlock? House lives at 221B Baker Street. The names House and Wilson come from Holmes and Watson. The first patient is named Rebecca Adler, a reference to Irene Adler, a woman who outsmarts Sherlock. And then later, a more overt reference. Irene Adler. <gasps> House gets shot and hallucinates interactions with the shooter. They don't say his name, but he's credited as Moriarty, a reference to Sherlock's notorious adversary. And in the finale, House fakes his death and comes back to life, just like you know who. But more than cute Easter eggs, Dr. House values his intellect over his emotions, which makes him a savant in diagnostic medicine. Well, some doctors have the messiah complex. They need to save the world. You've got the Rubik's complex. You need to solve the puzzle. An average episode follows a pretty routine formula. A patient presents with an array of bizarre symptoms. So House and his team try to diagnose the patient. Like a murder mystery, the first part of an episode runs through the usual suspects. I'm thinking Colonel Mustard in the music room with the candlestick. There's no music room. It's the conservatory. Same thing. No, it isn't. So I'm going to say your mom in the hospital with a candlestick. And by candlestick, of course, I mean inherited OTC deficiency. We get to know the patient, their history, their struggles, and it's likely that their personal life is directly tied to their illness, either literally or thematically. By the midpoint, the patient's health gets worse. New symptoms appear, or their original symptom magnifies, which stumps the team. Nothing really fits, and they're left with impossible options. Shocks without shock, and itch that won't stop. She needs Dr. Seuss. Gotta head off the worst worst first. I studied under Dr. Seuss. In the last act, the consequences are dire. The patient is on the brink of death, and their social life is being severely tested. But House saves their life, either by uncovering a new piece of information, challenging an original assumption, or by receiving one of his classic epiphanies, usually by an offhand comment from his friend, Dr. Wilson. I've just given you the answer, haven't I? The patient lives, or occasionally not. Their personal life survives, or occasionally not. Don't worry, it's treatable. Being a bitch, though, nothing we can do about that. You figure that out by taking off your sunglasses to the strains of a Who song? 
life goes on, and maybe we learn something along the way. But unlike criminal cases that can be demonstrated as a sequence of events, explaining medicine to people who aren't doctors is tricky. You want us to consent to this? I don't even understand what you're talking about. Well, wait. I mean, what does TTP stand for? Some really big words that you've never heard before, and when we're done, we'll never hear again. Have a nice day. Feel what? I don't even remember. It's just a fancy way of saying small adrenaline secreting tumor. Yeah, I clarified it for you. You know what a hemorrhoid is? No. Well, Google it. I'm actually impressed that a series with so much anatomical jargon was successful. I'm not a doctor, but I am still fascinated because the medicine is motivated by character. Your income, your genes, your diet, your environment, anything about you can affect your body. So the solution isn't a random disease, or if it is, there's something ironic about it. Oh, it can hit you that fast. Treatment for PRCA is blood transfusions. The treatment for MG is hyperbaria. You were doing both as part of your regular freak show. You took a break, everything went to hell. Or maybe they solve the case mid-episode, but the treatment presents an ethical dilemma. Is there anything on the recipient exclusion criteria that would disqualify your patient from getting a heart? But usually the patient is hiding a crucial piece of information about themselves, conforming to Dr. House's misanthropic worldview. It's a basic truth of the human condition that everybody lies. The only variable is about what. Which is why he doesn't visit patients or their families. If we don't talk to them, they can't lie to us. And we can't lie to them. Except he does in almost every episode because the patients are a source of drama. They're catalysts for ethical debates and insights into House's character. Obsession, truth, morality, purpose, misery, pain. So you hide in your office, refuse to see patients because you don't like the way people look at you. But my favorite episode doesn't have a case at all. The episode is titled Broken, written by several House veterans and directed by Katie Jacobs. It's twice the length of an average episode, or depending on the platform, split into two episodes. And there's a lot of unfamiliar territory, a new location, a new cast. House's psychiatrist, Dr. Nolan, House's new love interest, Lydia, who visits her sister-in-law, Annie, a silent catatonic. And other patients like Freedom Master, a man who believes he's a superhero. I can fly. <laughs> and Alvy, House's bipolar roommate. So what do I call you? You can call me House. Ow! He's a brick. House. That's a lot of new stuff, and not only does the episode conclude well for House and these new characters, but I honestly feel like this episode concludes the series better than the actual finale. After a certain point, every TV show eventually dips. That's the nature of serialization. But it's rare to find such a clean break where you can say, that's it, stop right there. I apologize in advance because this will be my longest and densest video to date. No matter what, I'm going to feel like I'm leaving something out, so I'll be analyzing everything but the kitchen sink. Character, structure, framing, arcs, love, and the existential questions that keep me awake at night. And if you're lucky, the kitchen sink too. Did I miss anything? Kitchen sink? At some point, you may think I'm overanalyzing, and to that I say, duh. But I'm not here to make easily digestible videos. I'm here to surgically remove the worms in my brain and force you to watch. The audience will be comatose by paragraph two. I want a joke. If your history with House is catching episodes out of order on cable, you might be wondering why he's in a mental institution. Well, you've got two big reasons, Vicodin abuse and emotional baggage. The Vicodin is pretty self-explanatory. 
House had an infarction, a clot in his leg, which went undiagnosed and led to muscle death. Stacy, his girlfriend at the time, saved his life by authorizing the removal of most of his thigh muscle while he was in a coma. So he takes Vicodin for the pain, though it's heavily implied that he liked drugs before his leg. You're pretty good at that. I know my way around a razor blade. Now he has the perfect excuse to take opioids. And I guess it raises the question, what's the difference between a legitimate need for painkillers and an illegitimate need? He's not addicted. He has to take drugs. The definition of an addict. He's in pain. And addicted to painkillers. What a coincidence. Pain is subjective. It's not always clear how much medication someone deserves or how often, especially if you factor in tolerance and addictive personalities. House can claim up and down that he takes Vicodin for his leg, which would be a physical dependence, but it also conveniently diminishes his emotional pain too. It's not just your leg. You want to get high. You're doing what, 80 milligrams a day? Oh, that's way too much. Moderation is the key, unless there's pain. It's double what you were taking when I hired you. Because you're twice as annoying. And philosophically, that's really no different than your average stoner. People take drugs to alter their natural state. By definition, that's what drugs do. But if you can't feel pleasure, what's with the cocaine? Really? Is that why you do drugs? Because you're happy? Most people do them because they want to be happy. Except that socially, you're allowed to criticize stoners without injuries because they don't need narcotics to function. In fact, they usually function poorly. Why do you hate drug addicts? Your situation is different. You're taking a necessary prescription. I know. I'm fabulous. But House's physical pain and emotional pain are almost inseparable. I'm guessing that you weren't exactly Mr. Sunshine even before your leg got messed up. What was he like before his leg? Pretty much the same. So as long as he functions anywhere close to neutral, the people around him can't really make him stop. And everything's the leg? Nothing's the pills. They haven't done a thing to you. They let me do my job. And they take away my pain. Of course, the problem is that his addiction is contingent on his mental health. When his life sucks, his dosages go up, which is bad for the body and bad for the mind. And eventually his addiction reaches a breaking point. I'm hallucinating. So in a montage at the beginning of Broken, after years of popping pills, House finally detoxes from Vicodin. But in order to get his medical license back, he has to get the approval of Dr. Nolan, who believes his issues run deeper than Vicodin. But you have been abusing Vicodin for years. Never had delusions, never had trouble sleeping, never had any problems other than narcissism and antisocial behavior until two colleagues died. Your father died. So House is coerced into staying for his own mental health. Welcome to Ward 6. I love Broken because when it comes time to address House's issues, it removes him from his familiar environment. He can't fall back on his calling cards. On some level, House is a collection of unrealistic personality traits that go a long way to cushion his rougher side. Can we forget my vices, get back to my virtues? He can play piano, guitar, and air guitar. He can speak several languages, Portuguese. The Journal of the Instituto de Higiene e Medicina Tropical. You don't read Portuguese? Spanish. Donde trabaja su hijo los sabros por la noche? Honest, I have no idea what I just said. Mandarin. No, you gave her the wrong pills. You speak Mandarin? A little bit of Hindi. And just a touch of Korean. Nobody speak Korean on this flight. I assumed you did. I know how to ask him if his sister's over 18. There's something that's going to help. He can juggle, yo-yo, and skateboard. I stuck that primo. How rad am I? He drives a motorcycle. Evil Knievel had the same setup. He's a fan of Oscar-winning films and classic literature. On top of being the smartest doctor on the planet, 
They assume uh, House is a great doctor. Why would you assume that? Because uh, when you're that big a jerk, you're either great or unemployed. But it's hard to ignore your flaws if you have no way to redeem yourself. House can't even play the piano unsupervised. Without a case, without a patient, who is he? The medicine and the secondary characters are great, but I'm not really interested in a soap opera about doctors saving lives. Why are you so afraid of making a mistake? Because I'm a doctor. Because when we make mistakes, people die. More than anything, I'm interested in this character. If House wasn't on the show, it would be generic. Why do we do this? Because we're doctors. If we make mistakes, people die. But on the flip side, suspending everything else and focusing on him is genius. Rhymes with penis. The goal of the episode is to establish what we've learned about House, his maladjusted attitude, his defense mechanisms, and then slowly bring him to a place of stability. I'm guessing that's how actual therapy works, but I'm not a mental health professional, so please do not take my commentary or this work of fiction as gospel. Structurally, though, it's remarkably similar to the five stages of grief, which makes for a nice dramatic arc. Five stages of dying. Exactly. Personally, I think it's all just new age crap, but from your tear-filled puppy dog eyes, I think I made my point. Denial. I'm sane, rational, capable, I should not be here. Anger. I'm not allowed to get angry. Bargaining. I need to address some deeper issues, which I can do on an outpatient basis. Three hours a week? And that's just my opening offer. If you want to counter, I'll likely fold. No. Depression. And eventually, acceptance. Simply put, it's a shift from resistance to acceptance. But to be clear, I do mean acceptance, not submission. There's a difference between making a choice and a choice being made for you. It is my medical opinion that the patient is healthy and can be released. Thanks for letting us know. Most of House's dramatic obstacles are external pressures, usually bureaucratic authority figures or invisible forces like unpredictable illnesses. Basically anything out of his control that makes his life worse. Narratively, this creates conflict, which is essential for storytelling. But it also has a way of exonerating House's faults. For example, in season three, Detective Tritter, a clinic patient, is rude to House. Treat people like jerks. You get treated like a jerk. So in turn, House puts a thermometer in his rectum and leaves it in. You can berate patients all you want, shoving objects, into their rectums is assault. Naturally, Tritter is upset. So for several episodes, he makes House's life miserable by investigating his Vicodin usage. He squeezes his colleagues for information, he basically cuts off his supply, and all but forces him to go to rehab. You son of a bitch! And when I watch this arc, I'm thinking, dude, just let House have his Vicodin. Let him steal prescriptions. Let him punch his employees. Just leave him alone because it's framed so that House's biggest weaknesses are Tritter's fault. You know you have a problem. Yeah, he's got a badge and everything. When Tritter is gone, the episodes go back to normal. Everything stabilizes, and look at that. House's life is so much better without all of that bullshit. Even the finale uses jail time and an illness to force House into an extreme, and maybe even sympathetic, situation. So at the beginning of Broken, you can almost taste the revolution. Like any classic institution story, we're expecting our lucid rebel to flip the hospital upside down, and let us know that, hey, you're not crazy, life is crazy. I mean, what do you think you are, for Christ's sake? Crazy or something? Mm -hmm. Well, you're not. <laughs> you're not. You're no crazier than the average asshole out walking around on the streets, and that's it. There's our little doctor. homage to uh, no, no, no. Jack Nicholson no, no. and the ski cap. I'm sorry, Dr. Yeah. Nolan left specific instructions. Because if you acknowledge it, it's an homage, not a ripoff. That's right, America. And he's black. 
thought you'd be a little more sensitive on the slavery issue. And once again, House is given an ultimatum by the king of the castle. The difference is Dr. Nolan isn't constraining House because of a personal vendetta. He has no preconceived notions about him. It's his job to maintain order in his hospital, and anyone who fights that is probably in the wrong. Do you think he's serious? He's a doctor. He knows that acting out will only reinforce her diagnosis. Or it'll work. You actually think this is something we should be concerned about? A patient makes a threat, you should always be concerned. All of the doctors at Mayfield are trying to help their patients. It's just that House doesn't believe their help is worthwhile. You do know I'm trying to help you. I also know you're trying to be sweet, caring, and effective. You're just not. He's stubborn like that. I don't need help. I don't need help! So House cycles through his go-to solutions to get what he wants. The first being negative reinforcement. My goal is to get your boss to write the letter that I want him to write. Now let's talk process. I can smile through gritted teeth and play nice, but there are serious risks of violence involved in that choice. So I'm going with turning this ward upside down, making you and your boss's job and life so unmanageable that he'll write whatever he has to write to get rid of me. If he's more trouble than he's worth, everyone else will give up. Most people have a limit, and House is willing to test the patience of others just to see how they react. He'll scream, embarrass himself, and persist until he wins. Is this your master plan? Disrupt hospital business until I replace your carpet? Devious. Saw it in a James Bond movie. Fecal smear! House starts by pouncing on everyone else's issue and brutally using it against them. Cut your wrists, huh? Greg, there are certain topics... Oh! I'm sorry. Suicide taboo. Gosh, if I've broken a rule on my first day, I will kill myself. This is House's caricature. He's the guy who's going to insult you and bite your head off when it's over. But being a burden doesn't do him any favors. By blaming the doctors for his situation, he doesn't have to work on himself. And targeting the patients makes him a pariah. But who cares if you get what you want? In this case, though, he doesn't. The staff is used to dealing with worse behavior. You're not getting any hell, dog. Sorry. So House gets stuck in a padded cell, which is appropriately symbolic. Slap enough hands and no one wants to be around you. It doesn't bring him any closer to freedom, and it spoils any goodwill he could have had. If you keep up this scorched earth policy, you're going to end up living in this room. Are you ready to try another strategy, or do you want me to leave you in here? Came to fight the man, and he had the master plan, but it started to unravel. No one smashed him with his gavel like. Shut blah. up. All right, new plan. If elbowing your way through life doesn't work, go for the nuclear option blackmail. If you think nothing's working, you can always go back to your schemes. God, if only you'd said that two minutes ago. Before I came out with my new scheme. Now I'm committed. Ha! Get it? House is convinced that Dr. Nolan is having an affair. So if he can break into his office, look through his calendar, and discover the name of the woman he met with, he can use that as leverage. It's a classic House technique. Oh, and for the record, you are the worst transplant surgeon in this hospital. But unfortunately, you're the only one who's currently cheating on his wife. But he's out of favor for breaking all of those rules, so he doesn't have access to that particular floor. Luckily, House has a manic sidekick who's eager to fight the power. Plan B. B is for blackmail. I got you covered. Come on, stop. Alvy tries to break in, unsuccessfully, but House has the woman's license plate. If he can call Wilson and get him to run the plate, he can get a name. But Alvy and House don't have phone privileges, and there's only one patient who does. That's Hal. His real name is Connor, but we call him Hal. Yeah, I got it. So, how are they supposed to get Hal on? Just do it already. Give me five milligrams of Haldol! 
In order to sell this as a fake fight, you probably noticed a cartoon playing on TV. Well, fun fact, originally this was a clip of Family Guy. But presumably due to copyright contracts, most modern platforms have replaced the clip with a generic cartoon from season seven. Dr. House, if you're gonna save this patient, you'll need this. Get this thing out of my sight! Anyway, back to the fight. House cheeks the pills and trades them for Hal's phone card. After all of that work, all of that ingenuity, you're rooting for House. You're hoping that his best friend is going to bail him out of a jam. That's the cornerstone of their friendship. Wilson has a lot to give and House has a lot to take. What took you so long? Even when House deserves discipline, Wilson loves to enable him. With a patient? Did she die? No. Then she can wait. Can this wait five minutes? Is she dying? Yeah. Before the end of this consult. They could build monuments to your self-centeredness. You eat neediness. Lucky for you. She's not me. Well, she is me. But that's not why she's attractive. She's a needy version of me. It's hard to imagine such a mythical creature. I'm gonna order up some extra pain meds. I love you. I'm so sorry. I wish I could help you. You can. If Wilson puts his foot down, it's really serious. So what is House supposed to do? He's burned through all of his options. I'm gonna cooperate. That's not much of a plan. That's actually their plan. You know, I'm pretty sure their plan is for me to actually swallow the pills, to actually cooperate. <laughs> Faking. But at this point, why pretend to go through the motions? What's the biggest threat of taking antidepressants? The only reason to take antidepressants is because you're depressed. You, you have to admit that you're depressed. I guess House's ego. How depressed are you? I'm not depressed. If you're the hero and the institution is the enemy, then their advice is useless. He tried therapy once in season five, but gave it up immediately. I'm not going back, because it doesn't work. But deep down, House knows that he's damaged. I think he dismisses help because he feels like he's beyond repair. Don't cheat. Scam. Find some way to keep using. These people know what they're doing. These people don't know me. And he had the opportunity to get clean in season three, but faked his way through rehab. See this big fancy wing? It was built because this program works. Faulty logic. This big fancy wing exists because some people with money think that it works. Want to believe that they can buy a better world. This is nothing short of idealized despair. Let other people wallow in it. House resents the platitudes, the slogans. People have romanticized humanity by coming up with meaningless cliches. When House is faking, he parrots the cliches right back at the staff. How are you feeling today? Yesterday, not as good as tomorrow. And it works. House ascends the ranks and restores his goodwill, but he can only pretend for so long. Today we're here to congratulate Susan. He has to watch other patients leave before he does. He has to jump through hoops to fake a urine test, just to prove that he's really taking his meds. And eventually his idle cooperation reaches a tipping point. One of the doctors tries to convince Freedom Master that he's not a superhero, but obviously it doesn't work. It's a delusion. So House has to get involved. Why are you doing that? House, it's none of your business. I'm just curious. As a doctor, what are you doing? Either he is Freedom Master and he shouldn't be here, or else he's suffering from a serious and dangerous delusion that he needs to deal with. The doctor accidentally provokes Freedom Master into a psychotic break, so they drug him and he's left in a depressive state. You did this! 
He was functioning. He was happy. He was delusional. Yeah, he's way better off now. Dr. House, let's talk. Even when he's faking, House doesn't know how to handle his emotions. Passivity makes him jealous, and stupidity makes him angry. They screwed him up. And for the record, I am two privilege levels above Susan. I got the same depression scale score. Every patient is different. It's not about scores and levels and- Happiness is happiness. The test is the test. Coping is coping. And you think you're a- Absolutely. Yelling about your mental health isn't exactly a sign of good faith. House prides himself on his rationality at the expense of his emotions. That's a good thing. If emotions made you act rationally, well, then we'd be called emotions, right? But whether he likes it or not, human beings are emotional creatures, so to ignore his emotions entirely is, in itself, irrational. House should agree with basic logic. My body can get sick, my mind is part of my body, therefore my mind can get sick. This is a syllogism, it's a conclusion based on two premises. But a lot of people are victims of their own self-preservation. We can accept things as true and still reach faulty conclusions. This pen is red. Its ink is red. Is all ink red? No. See, that's what we call a faulty syllogism. House is rational, so he accepts human fallibility. But he's also cocky, so he tends not to see it in himself. I recognize that confidence is not my short suit. I also recognize that I am human and capable of error. So you might have screwed this up? No. So it's merely a theoretical capacity for error. Good point. As a doctor, House knows his body can get sick, and he knows the mind is part of his body. But does that mean House's mind is sick at this moment? Not according to him. I can cope! I'm coping! In fact, I'm coping better than you think. I've not been taking my meds. Not one. And yet, I still scored high functioning in your depression test. So your proof of your well-being is that you lied? Manipulated. But I think anyone on the outside can see that House doesn't know how to cope. Other than running to drugs, he has a pattern of self-harming in extreme circumstances. House, these cuts are straight in a row. You did this on purpose. Cutting releases endorphins, endorphins relieve pain. Sure, it's all in the name of relieving pain, but it's not healthy behavior. And if negative reinforcement, blackmail, and faking tell us anything, it's that he's not coping now either. These aren't benchmarks of mental health. And Dr. Nolan knows that. These are your pills from today? I'm not gonna take it. I'll just cheek it again. Lick it. You want me to lick your hand? I washed. It's sugar. Nolan already suspected that House was going to cheat, so he switched him to a placebo. The fact that House delivered urine on antidepressants was proof that he was faking. The unstoppable force meets the immovable object. So, what's the next plan? There is no new plan. I'm out of plans. House is dejected, but he still wants to help Freedom Master. He deserves to feel like a superhero again. They sneak out and go to a fair, and House takes him on a wind tunnel ride. Freedom Master feels like he can fly, and he bounces right back. He's happy and excited again. It was the coolest moment of my life. It was fun. You can repay me by telling Nolan he's an idiot. Smell that fresh air! In the warmth of your yellow sun! We do enjoy it. <sighs> House did it to be nice, but if it makes Nolan feel like an idiot, then so be it. Hey! But the unexpected happens. There's no cry for help. There's no cat in a tree. Thank you, Greg. No! Freedom Master lives, but Nolan finally gives up on House. I'm transferring you to Winslow Psychiatric. You'll have better luck pulling the wool over their eyes. I'm done. Don't. I 
I need help. House has always been more masochistic than sadistic, but now that his rebellion has hurt someone else, he acknowledges his problem. He's willing to participate in the system he was fighting against. Therapy is a long-term process, longer than any one episode can explore. But the point is that House needs to trust someone else's expertise. So maybe there's a short-term process to make that point. I know you don't have a problem taking drugs. For my leg, for pain. Well, think of this as being for psychic pain. I don't want to change who I am. Miserable? Antidepressants have plenty of side effects, but a lot of people avoid taking them just because change is scary. We build our identities around our strengths and our weaknesses, and even that can be comfortable. As the philosopher Cobain once said, I miss the comfort in being sad. But here's the real fear. You think that by taking meds, you'll lose your edge? Stop making the unique connections that make you a successful doctor? The foundation of the show is that House's medical abilities come from his callousness. If he doesn't care about patients, he can make tough calls. If he doesn't have any loved ones, he can focus on the case. The reason normal people got wives and kids and hobbies, whatever, is because they ain't got that one thing that, that hits them that hard and that true. I got music, you got this. The thing you think about all the time, the thing that keeps you south of normal. Yeah, makes us great, makes us the best. All we miss out on is everything else. And maybe he's supposed to be miserable. Maybe that's what it takes to be exceptional. Big picture, I don't care if Jonas Salk's life is a miserable shell, I just want him to cure polio. You can't live your life big picture. Objectively, what is happiness worth? We've seen that compromise in practice. When House is pain-free, he makes ordinary decisions. In season five, House takes methadone, which is typically used to help addicts through withdrawal. Stupid product. Heroin without the high. For House, it completely eliminates his pain. He's kinder, respectful, and he accommodates the wishes of a patient's parents. I'm gonna schedule their son for an MRI with contrast right away. But it turns out that's what makes him sick. Your son was fine when he got here. Is your freaked out overprotectiveness that nearly killed him. So House quits methadone, embracing the cautionary tale that pain makes him exceptional. You don't need your pain to be a good doctor. I'm not interested in good. You're afraid to be happy. Why do you care if I'm happy? In season four, House pranks his team by pretending he has syphilis. Then he pretends to take penicillin to get better and thus pretends to get nicer. Well, they're all good ideas. Even though he's faking, it worries his team. Does happiness make House part of the crowd? A million different things make us who we are. You change one, you change everything. It, Mozart was better adjusted. Decides to play catch one day, maybe there's no magic flute. We gave Van Gogh chelation therapy. Turned him into a house painter. Van Gogh was your patient be satisfied painting houses instead of the starry night. Van Gogh would still be making inspired paintings of the night sky. Just maybe not from the room of his asylum. You don't know that. I know both his ears would be intact. And I know his life would be better. House has every reason to hesitate. Five years of backstory to give us doubt. But the alternative is what? Being depressed? I know this doesn't come naturally to you, but you want my help, which means you need to trust me. Hmm. Delicious. 